close executive session to conduct a student expulsion hearing to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body legal counsel or the public body litigation and collective negotiating matters between the board and representatives of employees. No action was taken during closed executive session. I would now ask that everyone join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> all right. I'd like to welcome our student ambassadors this evening with us, Sydney Walker. Um, do we have a recommendation for tonight's agenda? Yes, we do. I recommend the board approve tonight's revised November 1st, 2022 open session board meeting agenda as presented. Do we have a motion? So Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carried. We will now move on to our district highlights. I will ask that uh, Tisha Burns Spencer, principal of Hope Academy, to uh, come to the podium and present our first highlight this evening, Principal Burks Spencer. Spencer Burks. Spencer Burks. It says Burke Spencer. <laughs> if I got your name wrong, it's her fault. <laughs> okay. Good evening. I am Tasia Burks, and I have the privilege of being the principal at Hope Academy. Um, I am joined by Mr. Alvin Jackson, who is one of our family liaisons, and Miss Christy Lowe, who is um, over PBIS in our building. You can, do I have a clicker thing? Oh. How does this work? I think it's a green button, Katie. No. Oh, that one. No? No. No, that's a pointer. Oh. I've never done it. I just there we go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> It's the other green button, okay. <laughs> All right, so this evening we're just going to celebrate um, our family and community engagement, as well as let you know about our PBIS that is going on in our schools. And so we decided early on at Hope Academy that this is not what we want to do at Hope. It's not just gonna be something we can do by ourselves. So we want to uh, think again about the village that we used to talk about, the, the village it takes to raise children, the village it takes to see some growth. And so the first thing we did on day one was take our staff into the community where our students live and go visit those homes, connect with those families, um, give some books out, give some head headphones out, things like that, and just connect with families in a positive way. Um, so this was day one of uh, our school year this year to set the atmosphere. My turn. Okay, uh, so this was our family engagement week last week for our Halloween. We had a big event. We had the kids come into the building, do some trick or treating. We had some. Uh, should I use this thing too? You want? Yeah, you do that. So we had some, uh, and we had a large turnout. We had probably the biggest turnout since I've been at Hope Academy. I've been there about at Hope for eight years now, and uh, we had over 250 families. It was like 270 something come out for the event, great event, teachers in classrooms handing out trick-or-treat candy, and, and then we had a, uh, I'll, I'll wait for the next slide, okay, more of the trick-or-treaters, yeah. Um, this particular night is September, Attendance Awareness Month. We did a reward program for kids with high levels of attendance. I think 95% was the uh, measuring. Uh, stick we used and uh, the kids that uh, the kids that were eligible came into the building we had a movie night I had 20-foot projection screen we allowed the kids to bring in sleeping bags and blankets and pillows and we let them lay on the floor and we brought some snacks for them and we invited them in for a great time a movie night and I had a big box of hats that the community gave me so we had a hat fight and uh, let the kids fight over hats for a little while and they had a good time with that there's some more pictures of kids and families laying on the floor. Um, back to the village part, we are partnering with quite a few of our uh, businesses here in the Decatur area. So that's just some of the pictures 
of them. They came to our um, Halloween family festival night, um, and lots of families went to those tables, got lots of information. Um, so that's just a few of the pictures. We have other partners that are not featured there, like Grace United Methodist Church, and they are always there for anything that we need. Um, and so I just want to make sure we, we note that they are part of our village for Hope Academy. Uh, this is one of our PBIS events. Um, our first one was a kickball game that over 200 kids participated in based on grades. We've split them up. Um, the kids loved it. Um, they're excited about getting the positive um, and focusing on that, not only with students, but with also teachers and staff. Every morning, they recognize different positive referrals that classrooms, teachers, and other staff in the building get. Um, it's all about celebrating the positive. They were uh, fortunate to go to Black Bart's. Um, they went through the corn maze. Um, my biggest joy with this is when some of my eighth grade girls came back and they were so excited about having that pumpkin. And they were also leaders helping the little kids. So they really enjoyed it. It was the first time I saw a smile on a couple of the students. It was wonderful. Um, we had almost 200 kids go to that one also. Um, so there's some of the students and uh, staff. And a lot of the kids are like, I'd never been to a, a pumpkin patch or gone through a maze. So they were excited about that also. And then here's our PBIS dan dance that we just had. Um, we had separated in K through two, um, or yes, three, four, and five, and then we had the middle school. Um, we had probably with the K through five, over 200 kids participate in that. Um, with the middle school, we had almost 90 kids, and they loved it. I've never danced so much with students as I've ever done, but um, the kids are already talking about when's the next incentive. And some of the students that got to go to the dance, they've had some problems with behavior and we're seeing it turn around and they were so thankful to getting invited. So it was really, they're, they're accepting it and there's more buy-in as we go. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so yeah. much, Ms. Bart. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Sure. So are they the only schools that do P? I haven't heard that word in a long time, PBIS. So is that, are they the only school that does that? Do, are all schools doing that? Or is that just something that Hope opted in for? So Hope did opt in. It's for schools. Um, we allow the schools to uh, determine what works best or what was needed for their individual schools. So Hope, Franklin Grove, South Shores, and Muffley, I believe it is, are doing PBIS. And if I'm not mistaken, when my kids were Hope Academy kids, we went to the trick-or-treat night, and I still have dental bills, just so you know, <laughs> from all the goodies that they got. <laughs> but it was always a great turnout, so I always did appreciate that. It was always a fun time. Good deal. And just for everyone, um, just, so just to say, PBIS stands for Positive Behaviors, Interventions, and Supports. Oh, thank you. Isaiah. Thanks. And are there any certain guidelines? Like, can any school just say, we want this? Or does the school have to have a certain level of um, issues or concerns? Uh, if this is something that a school wants to do, it, just, it does take buy-in from the staff. It's just not something that you can just force upon somebody. So you will have someone like Cotton Student Services that will come out to the school and say, hey, this is what PBIS is all about. This is what is needed in terms of buy-in. This is what you can expect, you know, and it, everything has to be done with fidelity if you want to see change. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else regarding PBIS? Okay. School Board Members Day. Whereas school board members are elected to sit in trust for their diverse communities and in that capacity are changed, are charged with meeting the community's expectations and aspirations for the public education of their children. And whereas school board members are entrusted with the guardianship and wise expenditure of scarce tax dollars and they are responsible for maintaining and preserving the buildings, grounds, and other areas of the school district that the community has put in their trust. 
And whereas school board members are responsible for providing leadership that ensures a clear, shared vision of public education for their schools, that sets high standards for the education of all students, and requires the effective and efficient operation of their districts. And whereas school board members adopt public policy to give voice to that leadership and employ a superintendent to administer board policy, and are also responsible for the regular monitoring of the district's performance and compliance with state policy. And whereas school board members selflessly volunteer countless hours to public service with no compensation, and whereas school districts have faced enormous challenges over the past two years and the strong, dedicated leadership provided by the Decatur Public School District 61 Board of Education has allowed student learning and success to continue, and whereas employers are supportive of their employees who serve as school board members, generously lending support and time, employers <laughs> give their employees the opportunity to better serve the needs of the school districts and communities they represent through sometimes tremendous sacrifice to the employer, and whereas decisions made by school board members directly impact the quality of life and safety in their communities, placing them as the front line of American democracy, therefore be it resolved by Decatur Public School District 61 that we proclaim November 15, 2022 as School Board Members Day as a way to honor those citizens who devote their time and energy for the successful education of our children and our future leaders. On behalf of Decatur Public School students, administration, and staff, we thank you for your time, commitment, and service as school board members, and we hope you enjoyed the small tokens of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to our public participation. The Board of Education would like to note the following during public participation. Identify oneself and be brief. Comments should be limited to three minutes. Any public comments submitted to the Board Secretary will be included in the record. President Taylor, there is no comment, so you don't have to read all that today. You're killing me. <laughs> I, just, I just know I'm making you happy. Well, Ms. Bradford, do we have any wishes to be important? No, no we moving do not. on. We will move on to our student ambassadors reports. Is there anything the student ambassadors would like to report? All right. We will now move on to board discussion. Are there any items the board would like to discuss? I just have something light heart. I don't know if anybody else has anything, but uh, so under important announce or important dates at the end of the agenda is the legacy of learning dinner that is uh, Saturday evening and so I also serve um, on the foundation board as a trustee and and I was emailing with Zach Shields earlier today about seating arrangements and head counts and and that sort of thing and there are still spots at the district table like eight of them. So uh, it would be really great if we filled those. And board members, if plans have changed and you can now make it. Come hang out with us. Please do. Uh, I will be there with bells on and look forward to celebrating our distinguished alumni, seeing our students who, who help host the event. That's always a lot of fun, seeing a lot of um, our district uh, employees and administrators and um, also celebrating teacher of the year so anyway i i just it's not too late is all I, i'm saying i will be there i saw you on the I list yes, be there. yes. The and list. so we'll not sure where i'm sitting oh, yeah, but I saw you on i'll the list be there yeah. uh, there's a district table oh, okay yeah plenty of room many mouse wants to go yes anyway let's fill up those seats right. thank you Anything else or discussion? I just had a couple questions. Um, well, I guess one question. About a month or so ago, uh, Kent Metzger sent that very l lovely detailed list mm -hmm. of some of the punch items that we're still working on with some of the schools. It was just like an update on that. If we That's in the agenda. It was on. I didn't see it in my yeah. agenda. <laughs> I am so Next sorry, Kent. Next thing. <laughs> sorry, I should have. <laughs> you got the I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have a feeling I'm going to be talking to you. Okay. So I do apologize. I did not see it in my well, you've got the unrevised version of the agenda. Yeah. That's what it is. I probably do. <laughs> you know, I still need a new MacBook that works, too. Is there anything else before we move on to Kent's report? No. I do I apologize. I have some things I'd like to discuss. It's been brought to my attention that um, because we, we do only have 22 credits required for graduation, and if you multiply 7 times 3, the first three years, a student can get 21 credits. So a lot of students um, 
can get into doing other things besides taking regular classes if they go to Heartland Tech Academy or if they get take starting taking Richland classes. But there are several students that maybe are not going that direction. Um, I know that um, the idea of having a work experience coordinator is something I wish the administration would look into. I know the student, ha the person has to be certified. I would hope we would pay for somebody to get the training to do that because I think with that much time available, uh, certainly students, seniors who are really not looking into um, a specific thing that I just mentioned, who wanted to get work experience or an apprenticeship, it would be very helpful for them to have that work experience situation as a possibility. Um, two things I would like to have put on the agenda uh, for November 15th. One is grade promotion policy. When I looked at our policy manual, it did say something about that the board or the administration, I forget the wording now, will have a great grade promotion policy, but I don't know what it is. And so I, I, I would like to see that on the agenda so that we can have a discussion about what that is. And the other thing I would like to see on the agenda next time is just the phrase positions to open. It refers to what I've been talking about the last few meetings. But I do want to mention that I'm not just talking about more teaching assistants. I think there's a great need um, for elementary counselors, for social workers at all levels, um, for reading specialists, for RTI teachers, for small groups. And certainly, and since we're having such a difficult time, hiring elective department teachers in the high school, having ongoing open positions for that also. So those are other things besides the teaching assistance I hope that's part of that discussion. Thank you. I'm sorry, could you just repeat the last thing? Great promotion and what was your title for the other one? Positions to open. <laughs> All right. We will now move on to our reports from administration. I would like to call Kent Metzger, Director of Building and Grounds, to the podium to present the facilities update. Good evening. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank you for getting to speak with you tonight, and I know this has been a long time coming. I do want to point out that just a few more days will be my one year anniversary of being with DPS so congratulations I, uh, how's it been thank you it's been a whirlwind I'll give it that so we've been down a lot of paths thus far so um, I've kind of started to get my feet under me very well and understanding what's going on and some of the background so I'm going to uh, be somewhat brief there's probably far more information on here than what I'm going to speak to because I could do this for hours and no one wants to see that so um so the, the key points on the next page oh is this me mm -hmm. Big green. Right. Does that work just that one yeah nope. cool. nope. that one okay yep. thank you Still in work. there we go okay <laughs> so the presentation tonight is to uh discussion of um very the various categories here one is to review of the bold plan that was pre my tenure here so i'll try to update you as best i can um next thing will be a review of the 2022 projects we've completed and then an update on the 2022-23 projects we will be accomplishing and then our plans moving forward into the future we have a, quite a future ahead of us so it's exciting so these were the projects the buildings that had projects under the bold plan so it was a very extensive plan it affected nearly every building in the in the district the ones on the left hand column with the green check mark next to them are essentially complete um, there were some variations in that process, but um, essentially as they were in the bold plan, that's what came to fruition. And the, the items in the right column with the check marks are things still yet to be completed. So I, I kind of have them in order of the big things complete, but I'll go, I'll, I'll skip over Johns Hill for just a moment and go down. So the Southeast Elementary School demolition project is, is almost complete. They still have some minor um, surface removal, parking surface removal and some cleanup down there. Um, bomb elementary reconfiguration that was part of the plan um, initially there was a, a to shutter the building um, there have been some various thoughts on that and still it remains open so that's still yet to be completed and and then the Kyle building consolidation that was to consolidate the operations here in the district office in the Kyle building 
with uh, operations from PDI and also um, some operations in the, the Tech Academy, and that's still yet to come to fruition. So Johns Hill, obviously, is the big project that we've talked about so many times, and I have a lot of questions on, and we're still in the process of wrapping up some punch lists there. So um, essentially, you know, as a, a project in the mid-20 millions, um, right now what we have left to be paid out is about 700 and some thousand, and that's just to cover some outstanding punch list items. Some of the things of note are there were some floor finish issues in the first floor corridor, third floor corridor as well. Those yet to be taken care of. Um, the big thing that we got a lot of discussion about previously was roof leaks. That has been completed. Um, and so, you know, we've, uh, we in, at Buildings of Ground are satisfied with the fix. We haven't had a lot of rain since it's been done. So we're hoping that it, it, it also is, is, is done correctly. It, it looks much better. We're very, more, very much more pleased with the appearance. So we think that's going to work. <laughs> Excuse me, we got suffering from a little sinus thing this past weekend. Um, there are a few other uh, lesser issues going on at Johns Hill. We, we have a sewer issue, um, some water's coming back into the lower level of the auditorium. I think we've got some elevation issues on some storm drains. We're in the process of working on that. We, we again had conversations today. We have conversations on um, Johns Hill, if not daily, and not multiple times per day, um, at least you know several times per week. So we, we have not dropped any of those issues, and we continue to work on them very diligently, and um, we continue to work with the contractors to get that completed. Um, so on the, moving it on then, like I said, I want to be fairly brief because we don't have much time. These are the projects that we completed in uh, 2022. A lot of roofing projects. We did roofing projects at the buildings of grounds, the truck garage, which is a garage across the street from our main office building. We also did a roof project at Harris, which was in that building. The roof on that building was a horrendous condition, and so that was badly needed. The other big projects we accomplished um, were new windows at uh, South Shores and also at Pershing, the vast majority of Pershing. We took the buildings, you know, which were mid-60s vintage, put the windows in, and honestly, they just turned out fantastic. It just really upgraded the entire appearance. The entire in, inside feel is much nicer. We still do have to put the window treatments on um, those windows, but um, but th that those window projects, I just made a, a huge difference. We all did. We also did new exterior doors with that. Um, and other projects, some other projects that you know have brought a lot of questions and discussion. We're in the process of uh, uh, we constructed the playground at at uh, Hope. Um, we're waiting to get the pour in place surface down so we could open it for use. Um, Franklin Grove, the playground basically is installed with the exception of the pour in place and we started one at um, Muffley. Um, and then the weather kind of catching up with us at this point. So trying to concentrate on those things that um, are hard to work on with gloved hands. So some of the things had it got put aside and then of course now as we get more rain we'll start to fight the mud. So um, the important bit thing for this building is every time it rained hard and PDI, um, when you see the water standing in the viaduct under here, it pushed the sewer back up into this building. So we had to dismiss a couple times. So we took some preventive work outside so that that doesn't happen again. So I think that will make operationally things much happier here. So I know it'll make and Phil happier to that. clean that up. <laughs> right, it's not so. a pretty sight. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Garfield, we did electrical upgrade, and also um, Stevenson, we did electrical upgrade, put in window air conditioners so they have cooling there, which is it's a nice add-on. Um, we continue to work with the technology department to do camera and technology upgrades. That's an ongoing thing. Um, you know, we, we meet bi-weekly to make sure that we're each up to speed with what we're trying to do. It's a good process. Um, okay. Um, we did a renovation of uh, a classroom space at Montessori for uh, Macon Pius Special Ed. Turned out very nicely. Um, Stephen Decatur um, got quite a bit of work. Um, new gymnasium, um, floor refinishing, new graphics, and new bleachers. So if you haven't seen that, that's very nice. Turned out very nice. And we did some work on the exterior uh, athletic facilities as well. So that's it. Quickly. Um, Oops, sorry. So there's a photograph of the bleachers at Stephen Decatur. Um, they put the graphics on. So 
got a little branding going on there. And then the lower right-hand uh, photo is Pershing with the new windows. And you'll notice on that upper story, that's the gymnasium multipurpose room. That's a translucent panel so that it, it lets diffuse light come in. Um, so it's not glary in there, but it's, it's a very nice level of light in there as well. So very much more attractive. Uh, next page is the top one there. In the top left is South Shores. Again, really brightened that up. And then the lower right hand uh, is the new, well, I'll call it a circle drive, a different drive configuration at Franklin Grove. Okay, what we're going to accomplish in FY 22 23, well, we'll continue to work on the playgrounds. Um, we have still have to install a, a new canopy over the main entrance at Pershing, and we still have to complete the roofing re roof project at Pershing and South Shores. Uh, we're working on secure entry at Baum. Uh, we're doing renovation for Harris with Macon Pie at Special Ed. And um, there's a pretty extensive tuck pointing work needs to be done on the parapet on the upper roof at Kaleidoscope. And um, so we're going, and that's the thing, we're going to need to, we don't really have a lot of projects slated right now for either one of the dentist campuses, but with the need to extend their life, we're going to have to do some work there. And in Eisenhower High School, I put this down as a, it's a fairly large ticket item. We're trying to, um, reconfigure the method the system the procedures at which we're circulating water through the geothermal loop so not to get too deep in the, wa in the woods with that one but there's there are a number of wells out underneath the football field and that is the sink for heat and cooling for the building we were starting to see elevated temperatures in that and i was very concerned on that friday before school started on monday that we were going to have school on monday because we couldn't get that temperature to come down we couldn't cool the building so we've made a very aggressive effort to try to troubleshoot that we've made some changes to the operation of the <coughs> system the temperatures are starting to drop now we're in the cooling mode or heating mode hopefully we'll have um, good luck with that but if not i'm going to probably be bringing to you some level of proposal to approve to fix that long term because we can't jeopardize that, the cooling capacity of that building, obviously. So those are the projects that we need to complete or will be completing. We're working on MacArthur High School. Um, unfortunately, the Generals did not win their playoff game this weekend. So today we started tearing the bleachers down. And we'll take the bleachers down, the concession stand down, contractors. We're coordinating with contractors to put everything back together. Um, they're starting to have some audiovisual problems in the classrooms, which we're working with tech to fix um, we're going to be doing roof restoration at parsons we're also doing a re-roof at muffley um, secure entries and other buildings and so forth so lots of things to do so just to give you an idea this is the bleacher at macarthur in the background in the foreground you'll see that welded connection which is yeah. badly cracked with a couple of extra bolts in there that didn't it wasn't manufactured that way that's been put in through the years so it was time to take those bleachers down <clears throat> so plans moving forward try to put a wrap on this obviously the big thing is the new magnet school uh, we've had a building committee that's been working with BLDD architects um, dr. Clark um, dr. Curry myself um, other folks from DPS, Maria, uh, Ray Fry, Denise, I've been working with them, and, and then folks from American Dreamer as well, and then people from the community. And it's been a great collaborative effort. Effort, excuse me. Uh, there's been a lot of input, and we have just been so pleased with how BLDD has taken the input of that group, gone through, waded through all that, come together with something, and and presented that to us, and it's moving along in a very very nice pace so on the uh, at the next board meeting on the 15th we have invited bldd to come oh i'm sorry mr clevenger was also in on that committee um uh, we're going to present to the board what that's going to look like i think you'll be pleased um and so we're going to give give you just a presentation and then open up for some questions and comments from the board at that time so that'll be that'll be one to look forward to 
And then the final thing I have on my list is uh, facilities management plan. And this is part of the strategic plan. This was uh, an endeavor I took on at my previous um, school district. And what, what, that's, what we're going to do is we're going to, my staff and I, and with the input of others, we're going to look at all the buildings in the district and we're going to start to assess the strengths and weaknesses of each building. And then we are going to start to assign priorities to those on one, three, five, and 10 year horizons, assign dollar amounts to that and try to inflate those dollars with inflationary numbers. So as we move forward into the future, the administration can work with you to prioritize and develop along with any other facilities uses and so forth, decide which, in what way to best spend those dollars. So we're being very proactive and not reactive in how those dollars are spent. So um, this was a very useful process for us at my previous job. And it's just a, it's a tool that can be looked back upon. It's a living document. So as things change, we can change that document. But it is a very, a very good tool to be allow, to allow you then to make decisions to move forward. So, so that's it in a nutshell. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer your questions for you. I have just one thing. I was able to attend one of the new Magnet School Committee meetings just as a guest, and, and I love the blueprints. Um, a lot of things we're paying attention to security, which is a big thing nowadays. And this ties into something that just um, came to my attention. A grandmother said her grandchildren at the high schools uh, are not real fond of having glass walls in the classrooms. As a former teacher, I was never fond of having that because you got those automatic distractions. But as, as a security thing, it, it's just something I think, I'm not asking you for to say anything tonight. I just wish you would share that with BLDD. I don't even know if they were planning glass walls, but just I thought that's something to be addressed. I appreciate that. And um, I think you'll find that this building is a very realistic building. Um, to the board's credit, um, when we started this process, I was given the latitude and the authorization to list the deficiencies that we've noted in other buildings and also to look at the things that we would like to see and to prioritize some of the functionality, uh, maintainability, and along with energy efficiency and so forth. Um, so all that stuff has gone into the mix and BLDD has been fantastic about integrating those things into the process. So that question alone, I think you'll be quite pleased with where they're at, so. Thanks. Well, I noticed that diplomatically you don't have anything about the Kyle consolidation to be um, <coughs> Excuse me. put forward in the next year. We put the brakes on consolidating Kyle and PDI because we felt that it was the priority was always going to be doing stuff for the schools, that your, your efforts need to be focused out there. Mm -hmm. Still, at some point, you do have to consolidate. This building is very old and not less. When do we feel that there's enough work? Because, I mean, there will always be more to be done out in the schools, and I think that I always know. has to be our priority. You fixed the sewer back up this year, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. So We're good. And someday. Thank yeah. you for I mean, that. I, 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 <laughs> I mean, I want, I mean, is it like, are we never moving out of here, or is it something that you just don't, it's not on the priority anymore? We just changed our priority at this point in okay. time to focus on the schools. All right. Like I said, I mean, I'm not opposed to it being addressed someday, but the priority has to be the schools for right now. But mm -hmm. it has to, you know, I noticed that you didn't put it on there for next year, so I don't want it to be forgotten about. But, you know, we're holding your feet to the fire to make sure that your efforts are out in the field, not here in the Kyle. But I do feel like eventually it has to be addressed. Well, I think there needs to be, a, at the time that that's addressed, there needs to be an actual real plan about all of the vacancies mm -hmm. that will be left yeah. in those buildings rather than empty buildings in Decatur <laughs> yeah. that won't sell because they can't be listed. <laughs> right. So I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean and, they can yeah. be listed, but they won't sell. That's what so I mean. Like, yeah. plans, <laughs> what we're going to do with this when we're done with it, it has to be addressed as well. It can't just be left sitting here. So yeah. Yeah. that's something to yeah. think about as well. Okay. Uh, not that there's sentimental value, but I mean, you know, these buildings have been here all my life, you know, so. You want it? No, no, I'm just saying it's kind of <laughs> hard to see that go away but you know on the other hand it mm -hmm. might be nice to see some of them go away <laughs> anyways like i said i just i noted that you did not have them there that as a ambition for the next year and i appreciate that i mean 
keep your eyes where keep your eye on the ball where it's supposed to be. But. Yeah, I mean it's it's always there. It's it's obviously you know we're taking direction from you. Mm-hmm. So when you feel like that's time to take that step off, then we'll be prepared to do so. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks a lot, Ken. All right, thank you. Next report, I would like to call Lawrence Trimble, Director of Student Services, and Jeff Dace, Assistant Superintendent of P-12 Teaching and Learning, to the podium to present a general opening of school and P-12 assessment update. Lawrence and Jeff. (laughs) (coughs) Just fan it like this. Hey, thank you for making my papers wet. <laughs> good, ar- good evening to the Board of Education, Dr. Clark, uh, student ambassadors. Tonight, um, I'll be presenting uh, the annual enrollment update. And uh, the numbers that you will see will be the numbers that are reflecting, reflecting our enrollment at the 10th uh, day, day of school. Just for a little bit of context, I know we have some new board members. Um, this, this process follows board policy 6200, which is our instructional arrangement. So what you have before you are basically the guide uh, that we use in order to inform us of uh, our school class sizes. So um, at the K through two level across the school, across the district, excuse me, uh, we look at 22 as our targeted class <clears throat> class size, but we do have a two student buffer, so they actually can go to 24, and then three through six, um, they 25 is the target, but then we have a two student buffer, which is 27. Uh, the bottom, I'm not going to bore you with that, but this is how we kind of look at overcrowding, when to add staff, or when to add a new classroom. So that's kind of the guide that we utilize. Um, This is our second year of online registration. So uh, just as a brief summary, um, over the last couple of years, we have had a little bit of growth in uh, families, returning families uh, actually registering their students. Uh, You see the the number of students returning to the district who have not verified or updated their information. Uh, We are looking at ways to make that number smaller. Uh, This is a nuance that we deal with every single school year, Um, but we have a couple of options that we can explore, Um, but we want to be careful in in how we um, proceed or choose to respond to that. So we are already in conversations with um, the Secretary Union, DESPA, to look at our timelines and process that we would utilize for um, this upcoming school year's registration. So these are some numbers uh, for you to look at as it relates to enrollment. Uh, We have had some, we have had a decrease in enrollment um, over the last couple of years. Uh, So we are overall down 259 uh, students. And again, these numbers that you're seeing are reflecting the 10th day of enrollment. So it's the 10th day of 2021, I mean, of 21-22 compared to the 10th day of 22-23. Does this include Robinson Charter? Yes, it does. Um, Elementary school building comparisons. Now, these are all of the buildings, um, including the K-8s. But if it's a K-8 school, that it's only K through 6 that you see indicated in in the enrollment. So, again, fluctuations across the building. I'll let you give you guys a moment to look at that. Is Garfield and social emotional the same? Are they both? At Garfield? No. Uh, Social Emotional is the uh, former seat program. So it's at Harris? It's, yeah, okay. at the William Harris building. And then Garfield is our former William Harris alternative program <coughs> that's located at Garfield. Okay, and um, secondary enrollment comparison, I'll give you guys a moment to look at those numbers. And just for all intents and purposes, secondary is seventh grade through high school. On the K to eight schools, 
Mm -hmm. You said that was just K to six information. Correct. So the seven, eight for the K eight schools, where is that in here? In the K eight schools, you'll see it in the total total building counts that's coming up in another right. slide. Yeah. But this is just all of the actual secondary buildings. Gotcha. Yep. Okay, so these are total live counts. So as we look through um, our buildings and we act at our process is, is we have the actual enrollment counts and then we have the actual live counts, um, which are butts and seats. So again, you're looking at total butts and seats um, at the 10th day. So that's this does not include students. So if a student comes to school one day, they're still included in these numbers because uh, the no shows have been dropped at this time. And this is every school in our school district. What's self-contained? Self-contained are students who um, they don't have any movement and they're in our um, they are serviced through our make and pie it okay. program and they're in those buildings. And just to be clear again, Mr. Trimble, no show or students that never came to school. Correct. Students who do not show up one day at at all. They may have been on our rosters. Uh, also, we did not get any uh, indication that they transferred to a different school. Uh, we do home visits to those homes. Uh, we make multiple phone calls, um, send letters. And if we hear no response from them, they're taken off the roster. Now, this is um, our classes that are over cap, and these are current conditions. I, I felt it would be necessary for you guys to know um, kind of where our schools um, lie. And we did provide some information to you all uh, in weekly update. Uh, you guys received the class size chart. Um, but South Shores is the only school that has classrooms over cap. So we have um, a kid, actually it's one kindergarten classroom that has 26. Uh, but in our class size chart, we put 25, 25 just to make it equal. But as, after conversations with the principal, it's 26, 24. So it's one classroom over cap by two. Um, and then one first grade classroom over cap by one. So that that's 25, 24. I'm sorry. So South Shores is the only school that has kids that has classrooms over cap. Yes, ma'am. Okay. How many third grade classrooms does Johns Hill have? Three. They have three. They have three sections of. Okay. Yes. How many classes are at targeted class size in the district? Oh, I don't know that number off the top of my head, but I could get that uh, information for you. Um, we generally. So let me. I'll go all the way back to that slide. So when we're looking at class sizes, we generally go by 24 and 27. So the fluctuation in our district shows a sign of our mobility. So we may have students even moving from school to school, um, but the targeted class size, so in some buildings we have some, that, some uh, class sizes that are under and some we have that are right at cap, uh, whether it's 20, um, 27 or, or 24. But we can get those actual numbers because it's just a simple um, report that we pull um, three times throughout the week that show us in Skyward where our classes are sitting. So I, we can get that actual number to you. And then when we're talking about mobility of students between the buildings, is that only non-magnet schools? Because we're not adding students to magnet schools during the year. Right? Correct. We don't add. The only students we add to magnet schools are students that have been on the wait list, except for American Dreamer, um, whereby we have had to use that school for some overcrowding purposes. And would students be added from the wait list in grades that are already at cap? No. Okay. No, if they're at CAP, we don't ask students. What about ESL? ESL, Johns Hill is the school that um, services our ESL population, and they save spots for them. So they ESL students can come at any point of within the school district. And so uh, we talk with the administrator, and we know exactly how many spots 
um, that they save for ESL right. population. So, Mr. Trimble, uh, the students that we are sending to American Dreamer due to class sizes, what happened to what happens to them at the end of the year? So at the end of the year, every student. So there is a process uh, whereby students who are mid-year moves, uh, students that are sent to another school for overcrowding, which we call enrollment balancing. Um, through that policy, at the end of the year, they get sent back to the their home attendance center, um, and so. Um, it kind of it will fluctuate our numbers or help us with projections for next year. Uh, we have the pr there's a process whereby the secretaries will change the next building for the students. We run projections, but every student that is a mid year move or a student that is moved for enrollment balance for the next following year, they are put back in their home attendance center numbers. So they don't stay at that school if we move them for uh, administrative purposes. Could they be displaced more than one year from their home school? Potentially, but not often. We So because of the changes in the policy, we have really, really tried to keep students in the school of their, that they um, live in. Um, so it is an inconvenience when we have to um, move families. But through our process, we move families who enroll late. So this is why we encourage families to enroll early uh, when we open up registration, because if you are a later enrollment, you are more, you are prob you're probably the first in line to get moved. So that's kind of how we judge who goes. So if you have already been in that school um, for X amount of time, we try our hardest even when it, when it comes to siblings and different things, we take the, all of those into consideration before we move um, a family out of their home attendance boundary. Do we provide busing? Yes, we do provide busing for enrollment balancing. Um, and this is the other reason why we look at the magnets because we can bus students. We'll look, at, we utilize the one magnet. And, that, and let me preface that too. That magnet has room, right? So that's the reason why we use that magnet uh, because they have had room to place students um, but the magnet schools also we can bus from across the district so also we're not violating any other policy by moving students from one school to the to the next thank you well maybe there is something wrong with this mouse because I've clicked it a yeah. bunch of times maybe so okay all right so I believe this is the last slide I was on so with when it comes to staffing um, adjustments again we utilize the class sizes to inform some decisions that we make so we work with the DEA to um, uh, either add or subtract staff the only uh, thing that we the only adjustment that we made was at uh, Parsons Elementary where we removed, they had four sections of kindergarten and we moved them down to three. Um, just for uh, informational purposes, um, at this time there's 71 uh, regular ed and cross cat teacher vacancies. Last year there was 66, so we have a little bit of an increase there. Um, uh, families can appeal or they can request for another school so they can appeal being moved or they, they, they go through the student request for transfer process. So overall, we've had 55 requests come through student services for various different reasons from uh, not liking a teacher to not wanting to be moved to, to um, um, you know, social issues. I mean, the the issues vary and um, 39 were denied and 13 approved and three weren't needed all right that well that's it for my part um, any questions you guys might have you guys ask your questions right. in the middle I actually had a question oh okay um, it was you don't have to go back but it had to do with your online registration for yes 22, sir 23 uh -huh. I just don't understand 
that we have 1,091 returning students whose information has not been verified or updated. Right. I'm like, if they registered, then you would have that information, correct? So we have a process updated. in our district whereby we have what we call a rollover. So the rollover basically takes all current students and roll them over. Now, um, we still need, so our registration process essentially is an address verification process to ensure that families still live in the boundary. Um, and that group of students are uh, students and families who we just have not received any uh, updated information on. Um, and we could have gotten returned mail. And this is kind of the the difficulty, if you will, because those students come to school day one, but we have parents who just won't give us any information. And it is a cause for concern, right? Um, so they are technically active, but they have not went through the registration process. So we've talked about a couple of different things that we could do because if, uh, you know, this turns into a, a safety concern if we have to get in contact with parents. Generally, the, these are the students that have their cell phones and they can call someone to come pick them up if they get in trouble or what have you. Um, and so, you know, and it may indicate, it may be an issue also that later on someone will give their information. But at this point in time, um, we generally have, by day one of school, we have about a thousand kids who we still have to get that um, address verification uh, completed. So over time, um, that number does decrease a little bit more because like last year, um, we were at 95% by day 30 of school, right? Um, so over time, it does change, but by day one, that's, that, that's the number that we we're looking at. Uh, when we look, talk about online registration. Thank you. Yeah. So it, we're, we're, we're trying to think of creative ways, maybe incentivizing or uh, even going to a couple more extreme measures uh, as, as much as we can legally. Um, so <laughs> um, but we, we want to make sure that we can get that number as close to 100 percent as possible. Okay. Well, historically, there's got to always going to be a percentage of people that just won't do it. How, I mean, what's that? I mean, Historically, how many do you not get? Oh, it's it's that same percentage from year to year. I mean, it's we about it's always about to, yeah. yep about eighty five anywhere between eighty five to eighty eight percent of of people registered. So have about ten to twelve percent who who don't. Okay. Yeah. No. Lawrence, oh, I'm sorry, Lawrence. These the classes over cap slide. That is all schools, right? That includes yes. magnets. So there's Every no school. magnet school over mm -mm. Cap? Okay. No. And then and the mag magnets are more controlled anyway because they have a different process. Okay. And then for our vacancies, just the language of that slide reads 71 regular education and cross cat teacher vacancies uh, at this time. It's just reads ex exclusionary to me. So are we excluding any category of teachers? Mm -mm. Cross cat is a, a term for uh, teachers who provide special ed services um, so in a gen ed setting. Am I, am I explaining that right? I think the question may be also, are you meaning this time like today or this time on day 10? Oh, no, this time like right now. Okay. This no, is current. I, my question is, is this every teacher vacancy we have? We have 71 yes. teacher vacancies, yes. including special ed, yes. regular ed, cross cat. Yes. Okay. Yeah, no. So I get what you're saying. No, we're not excluding any category of teachers. Okay. Yeah. I'm curious with just one quick question. Then. The enrollment number of 8,012. Mm -hmm. And you said that includes Robertson Charter? Yes. How many are at Robertson? What's our actual enrollment in DPS that we service every day? So at Robertson Charter, I can't see that number, though. It was 300-something, I remember. When yeah, I it's... 194. Okay. So if you take Robertson Charter out and you take... Um, CELA, which is the former SEEK program out, that'll give you the number of, of students that we have. And I'm not a, oh, 78, 72 is what I heard. Okay, 78, 72 today. Thanks. Yep. Sorry, I, I, I wear glasses, but I, <laughs> I don't wear them, so it's hard for me to see those small numbers. You won't buy any. That's what I keep trying to tell y'all, it's right there. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> 
Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> this is a standing joke. Good evening, student ambassadors, Board of Education, Superintendent Clark. Good evening. Um, gives me pleasure to get up here before you all and give the assessment update. Fall assessment update. For Fast Bridge, which is our internal progress monitoring assessment, so we can form our instruction to see the skills that our kids need to work on throughout the year. We'll start off with reading and overall for the district. You'll see, and this is the pattern that each slide will follow from fall last year in 2021-22 20, to the winter assessment to the spring assessment. So the first three columns show you all three assessment windows from last school year and the last column is where we are currently at where we um, assessed as the fall of this year so if you want to do a comparison you will be comparing the grades from the first column to the last column so you can say overall as a district last year we were at 19.7 and this year we're at 22.1 so to read it across we went from 19 to 20 to basically 20 so we come in slightly higher than we did last year for math overall see the same pattern again fall winter spring last year and then fall this year where we're currently at by grades and you can see overall by the district we were at 14 percent last year and at 17 percent this year and you can see grades going up, fluctuating up and down throughout the year. But overall, higher than we started off last year, which is a good thing. Fast Bridge, 50th percentile or above. Again, you can see the pattern. You can see the increase. We're definitely starting off better than we did last year, which is good for our total overall, which includes general education students and special education students. So again, getting off to a, a better start for a regular school year to make that progress throughout the school year. Illinois Assessment of Readiness, the IAR, this is the state assessment. So what you just saw was our internal assessment. This is the state assessment on national, national standards. And as you can see dramatically overall, there's a dip between fast bridge and the state assessment these are our students that meet and exceed again for over time for 2021 to 21 22 for ela and english language arts and then for the last two columns for mathematics um, you can see this was at the end of last school year so uh, we were taking 22 23 this school year so from 2021 to 2022, we went basically um, a percentage point up from four to five, and then pretty much stayed the same for math. So overall, areas of development, areas of improvement that we need to address. Access, this is the measurement of English language proficiency for our English language learners who are primarily at Johns Hills. Johns Hill Madness School and MacArthur High School. Proficiency is considered at a 4.8 plus, and you can see out of 187 students that took the assessment one last school year um, scored at the proficiency level overall. So definitely that's an area of development for the district as well. PSAT and SAT. This is for high schools, seventh, seventh, I mean, ninth, 10th, and 11th. So you see our ninth graders, how they fared, um, meeting both standards. When we talk about both, we're talking about English, English-based um, reading and writing. And then we're talking about mathematics, which has a lot of, well, both, both categories deal with a lot of skills. Um, the English 
reading and writing also incorporates the writing also. So you can see overall how our students performed in each of our individual high schools. If it says minus 10%, um, again, it goes back to that confidentiality that it was below 10% uh, at that particular school. And you can see how we compare, our district compares overall to the state. 10th grade, same data. Um, our individual schools, a couple of kids at, well, we have Harris here, which is now Garfield. <laughs> and you can see where our district compares to the state. And they just took the fall, fall PSAT um, last week. So we will have those results probably near the winter break. And then you'll see our um, SAT. PSAT to SAT for our 11th grade students. It's particularly when they take the SAT for scholarship um, qualifications and college entrance exams. So you can see how we compare to the, our district compares to the state. And then at the bottom, the SA scores overall. Advanced placement. Again, um, you can see the tests that were taken at each individual school, the scores of a 3 plus, and why do we disaggregate the 3 plus? Because those scores will qualify for college credit, and you can see um, the percentages at each school and overall as a district. So definitely would like to improve upon that. When we also, although we do offer honors, um, advanced, you know, honors, advanced placement, and dual credit. We have a lot of students taking dual credit courses, you know, where they're acquiring college credit while they're in high school. There's not a particular assessment for that, so you wouldn't see that, but we have a lot of students benefiting from that and getting college credits while they're in our schools before they leave high school. Next steps, because if you see the data that we have, we almost need a next steps. Our focus, um, basically achieve basic comprehension for grade level readiness. Now a lot of people see that basic as, why just basic? Because if you see our data, um, we pretty much have a foundation problem. So we have to ensure that our students have a solid foundation at each grade level so they can progress through the grade levels. Uh, particularly when we talk about early childhood and those primary grades, we want to make sure they're coming out of pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, and second, so they're ready for not just that third grade assessment for IAR, but they're ready for each grade level. Pre-K, preparing for kindergarten, kindergarten, preparing for first grade, first grade, preparing for second grade. So if each grade is doing their part, then we can gain some traction and have a solid foundation to have some growth throughout the years, which is a highlight of at least we're starting off better than we did last school year. So that's something to um, boast about. It's a better start. Other next steps, um, partnership with Birth to Five Illinois. Um, they have a Birth to Five Action Council, which is out of the state of Illinois, because um, which they've already, the state recognized that early childhood is key. Again, if you don't have a solid foundation coming out of early childhood, you're, you're, you're pretty much just putting the Band-Aid on it throughout the grades. Um, Department of Teaching and Learning continuing to support foundation and build approach to school and district improvement, which is what I just described. Again, getting back to the basics, making sure our students have the basic reading, writing, and arithmetic skills, along with social-emotional, creating great culture and climates where students feel you know, like they belong, they're motivated and inspired to perform their best within our climates and involving the students. Students have to be a part of this process. You know, the district wants everything to increase, the teachers want things to increase, but until the students become a part of this process and they take ownership as well, as well as the home, uh, we're still gonna be sort of like spinning our wheels. So students are old enough to get involved in this when we talk about goal setting, getting their grades up, you know, knowing what the assessment is about and qualifying for scholarships, um, all of that students need to be involved in their own learning as well. And invest and encourage capacity building for our teaching staff and school leaders. And what that 
basically is saying is, you know, often in professional development, so our teachers can deliver the instruction, you know, better. So teaching and learning increases, and also leadership, investing in our leaders, because at the end of the day, leadership matters, and our principals are the conduit between the administration building and the teachers actually delivering the instruction that we need. So we have to invest in all of them, which is part of our next steps. Also, writing, if you saw the writing scores, our writing is far below average. So we do want to put some intentionality into that and start slowly a writing um, assessment process where we're assessing the writing. And statistics show that if you, the, the better that you can write, you mostly are writing about things that you read or things that you have done. So that is also increasing your capacity to engage in reading text and math text as well. So we do want to, we have assessments for progress monitoring tools for reading. We have progress monitoring tools for mathematics, but we do not for writing. So we think this will also enhance the reading and writing as well if this is an area of focus because from our assessment scores, these are low areas also. Writing assessment that we're um, introducing, curriculum-based, uh, written expression, uh, research-based. It will be administered to grades second through eighth. It's going to be a rollout period Well, this year uh, for the winter and spring windows. Starting in 2023-24, all benchmarking periods, which we're talking about beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year. Um, simple prompts per grade level. Like this year, they're just starting out. I'm going to show you a video of the simple prompts that they're going through where they're just writing for like three minutes. It may be about a book. It may be about a prompt that the teacher gave them, but to get them more acclimated in writing on a consistent basis and then just building that up. Sort of like building that reading stamina where you'll hear teachers say, hey, maybe they're starting off at 10 minutes, then we'll go up to 15 minutes, then maybe 20 minutes because you have to build that stamina up because if students are constantly just like reading or writing for two minutes and they didn't get a standardized assessment and it expects for them to sit down for 20 minutes, then we haven't designed the instruction to really prepare them. So they get frustrated and naturally they're going to do poor. So the rollout period um, for 22-23 for us this year, just written words, what can they write down, not paying attention to spelling or grammatical errors and then adding um, correctly spelled words. When we get down to 24, 25, adding correct word sequence, where we're talking about grammar, subject, verb, agreement. Uh, writing assessment, teachers have been provided professional development on this of how to administer the assessment. We know this is sort of like an inaugural year, first year, so we will be providing them support throughout the year. Teachers will administer a whole group four-minute writing fluency assessment. And again, um, they will score it at the end. Nothing too cumbersome for the teachers, but again, they will have support throughout this process. We just think it'll, it'll address overall our academic deficiencies. I think this is the video. Are you looking for a quick and easy way to help your child with writing? When done regularly, Quick Writes are a way to help your child find their voice, build competence and confidence in writing, and discover that they have important things to say. A Quick Write is a strategy used to build writing fluency. When a student is fluent in writing, they're able to write with speed and accuracy. Students will respond quickly to a prompt without initial concern for spelling and grammar. The purpose is for students to get their thoughts on paper without breaking their train of thought. All you need to complete a quick write is a paper, a pencil, a timer, and the writing prompt you will use. The entire process only takes four minutes. To begin, read the prompt to your child. Give them one minute to think about what they are going to write. At this point, they should only be thinking, not writing anything down. Once the minute has passed, have your child pick up their pencil and write for three minutes. Once the three minutes have passed, tell them to stop writing. Read over their writing and note the total number of words written. This includes misspelled words. The goal for their next quick write is to increase the amount of words written. You can use any prompt you choose. You can even have them respond to a story they have read or you have read together. 
Here are a list of prompts to get you started. Here are some tips to ensure the success of quick writes. Encourage your child to write for the entire three minutes. There may be some initial resistance to continuous writing, but the more often they do it, the easier it will be for them to write the entire time. The initial focus is not on spelling and grammar, but getting their thoughts on paper. Provide them a chance to read their writing to you. This will build their confidence in both reading and writing. And finally, encourage them to use words instead of numbers or textees. Two examples are listed here. Increasing student writing achievement is also a focus for our district. Beginning this year, during our winter and spring assessment windows, we will administer a writing fluency assessment to all students in grades two through eight. Beginning in the 2023-2024 school year, it will be administered during all three assessment windows, fall, winter, and spring. Our district is putting in place a three-year rollout plan for the writing fluency assessment. For the 2022-2023 school year, our focus will only be on the total words written during the assessment. In the 2023-2024 school year, we will also be assessing the number of correctly spelled words. Finally, in school year 2024-2025, we will add correct word sequences. Correct word sequences include correct grammar and punctuation. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please contact your child's teacher. So another video and another simple strategy that parents can actually reinforce this at, at home and they can, they can do this with their, with their children. So, you know, quick tips again for that home school connection. So it's just not all about when they come to the schoolhouse. And those are, thank you, that is the presentation. But I do have to add one more, and I'm involved the student ambassadors in this one. Hey, were you all in school today? You in school today? <laughs> all right. All right. That was simple. Look, you looking like. <laughs> all right. No, I, I, I preference that because in, when you ask how many students do we have, I asked for the number today, 700, I mean 7,872 students. But whoever's watching this board meeting, parents, um, it takes a village to do this work. And one of our Achilles heels and our problems is attendance. So no matter what we put forth, if our students are not in school, they're not there to take advantage of the quality instruction that the teachers are trying to provide to them. So, you know, um, as Lauren said, something as long as we're doing it legally but we really have to brainstorm around some um for lack of better vocabulary um corrective actions or something around this attendance because it is really impacting our student achievement if there's any of direct correlation to it it is student attendance if they're not there then of course we're going to see this and just pulling some numbers we have 497 students currently as of today that have missed 18 or more days already. We have 1,912 students that have missed nine or more days already this school year. That is a quarter of our students who are on track to miss 18 or more days this school year, which usually if it was um, that 18 is because that's 10% of the school year. Back in the day, that would, that would be like an automatic retention. Well, unfortunately, we can't retain all of those students because you talk about classroom size, all these classes will be busing at the scene. But, you know, the schools are doing their part as far as attendance plans and calling homes, making that connection, but it, 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 it has to start at home. So people listening, um, parents, community, kids out there, if they're not in school, they have to be in there to take advantage of what we're trying to do. Because if we continue to have a quarter of our students missing these many days, and we're not even halfway through the school year, we're gonna continue to go through this cycle of low performance. And it's not necessarily all of the time about, oh, they didn't get it. No, they weren't there to get it. So that is a big problem here in this district. So with that said, um, any questions? No, I just wanted to, um before you get a lot of pushback on your attendance soapbox, which is true, mm -hmm. just letting people know that 
influenza is hitting us hard right now. So is RSV, so is rotavirus, so is enterovirus, plus we still have COVID. So, I mean, there are a lot of legitimately sick kids right now, but I'm not making excuses for the attendance. I'm just letting you know some of the reasons why some of these kids are gone. So before people, you know, get mad at you, Jeff, for saying stuff about attendance, I just wanted to come to your defense and let you know what's going on. So I wonder about that, though. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, statistic relevancy. I wonder what last year's numbers look like at this time compared to this number, the this year's numbers for missing school. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Lawrence is listening. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for you too, Mr. That's Dave. a good point. Um, but yeah, and statistic relevance, um, you mentioned several times one percentage point increase in test scores. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's hard to prove that it is statistically it's not, relevant. I mean, it's, um, well, because you're not talking. You're measuring what, something like you will. I mean, that, that you're not. You're, I know what you're, you're getting at here, but it's not a statistic yeah. because it's not a sample. And yeah, you're not yeah, dealing with yeah. a sample, then there's no margin of error. It's just the numbers of the numbers. Yeah. So yeah, yeah margin of error doesn't exist. But it increases an increase. So. Yeah, I mean, it increases. Of course, let me just say, I know what you're getting at. When you're doing a sample, there's a margin of yeah. error, and you can say, but the, you're counting the whole number of yeah. the students. That's just what. I mean, did, it, it so. increases an increase, but, but I mean, it, if I'm driving down the road and my car is getting closer to its goal. That's an increase. If I'm pushing it down the road, <laughs> which it sounds like we're doing, what we're doing. Um, it but you're still increase, closer. It you're still closer to your goal, yeah. which is the end how of the road. We get Whether back you're in the pushing or seat. driving, you're still getting closer. So how can we get back in the driver's seat? I my don't, question. I don't love that pushing or driving analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I do have yeah. a question though for Mr. Days. Um, I noticed that our fast bridge data did we did a little bit better, actually, you know, better than what we expected. Mm-hmm. Is um, were you able to pinpoint why they did that didn't that increase didn't transfer over to state testing uh, other than the attendance because I do know that does make a difference if you're not here to take the test well yeah from day one uh, we have an alignment issue so although fast bridge assess standards based just like our state assessment there's an alignment of making sure that when we're covering the fast bridge is actually the standards that's on the state assessment and that has been a work in progress also so it goes back to that activity design uh, lesson design you know and and uh, that's that that's that language between teaching towards the test you're not necessarily teaching towards the test but you just want to make sure that those skills that will be assessed on the test that they have exposure to that and that's just going to prepare them for that grade level and for life but we have to make sure that it's the like yeah we're doing good on the standards that are assessed on um, fast bridge, or we getting better with that. But by time the state assessment come, have we actually exposed our students to some of those skills? So we recognize that's that's an area of deficiency as well. Okay, thank you. You know, when it comes to the IRA, what percentage nationally? I don't know if it's the national test or not. Meet or exceed expectations? Because I mean, let's not kid ourselves these aren't numbers are not good they haven't been good for a while right but i mean there's a big discrepancy between the fast bridge the ira i mean in my mind okay five to three percent that's a critical failure in all aspects i mm-hmm. mean that's i mean it, that, that, that's systemic that's an equation of failure it's a critical failure on that assessment yeah i mean it is mean it a, i mean is it a problem what's the percentage of everybody who takes a test that meets or exceeds because if you're saying three percent can pass that test and to, into an equ- ad- adequate level, I mean, I think the um, what's that I translate to in terms of reading at grade level? Right, because you're saying in fast bridge. I mean, I'm not saying that 25 to 30 percent on the 50th percentile is good, but they don't equate, and that's what you were just saying. Is that the? But we are judged based on the IRA. That's yeah. the basis of what we're getting hit at and hit on in the press. And, uh, and but even but even with the state, you know, the state I think was at fifty percent, and I had that I don't know how to sheet, but we were like nine percentage points off of the growth. The state made like fifty was at the fiftieth percentile in growth. We were at like the forty first percentile in growth, and the same with math. We were off about like eighty eight percent. So we're making growth. However, we're just starting so far behind, mm-hmm. and usually that's what happens because the further behind you are, the more growth that you have to make. 
So we're, we're, we're making progress. Um, it's just unfortunate this is the climate that we're in. You know, when they do look at the state assessment, it's, it looks like, you know, like, like you said, we're not doing anything, but our students are learning. St Fast Bridge is a national norm standardized assessment. We just have to make sure that the standards are aligning to um, IAR. So, you know, it's, it is like two targets, but IAR doesn't have a comparable benchmark or progress monitoring assessment for the state, which is one reason why they were talking about giving the IAR a shorter version three times a year, because now you're talking about apples to apples. Fast bridge apples, IAR oranges, so you got to still do that work to align them. And that's, that's a work in progress, and that's why you see the, the disconnect between the, between the scores. Okay. I mean, just from the IRA, from a mathematical standpoint, if they're, if they're multiple choice tests, you should be able to guess and do better than that. Uh, it's better but, than it's, it's more than multiple choice. You know, it's compare right. and contrast. I mean, you got to read this story, read that story, you know, compare what was in this story to that story. It's, they have, they, we've, we've moved far beyond multiple choice assessments. Okay. Yeah. Students I guess my tell thought you that. is we, we yeah. all <laughs> own part of this problem. Yeah. And we have a problem. There is, I don't think anybody in this room and everybody out there who's watching this can deny that we have an issue that we have to deal with. Right now, in my simplistic view, this is like we're driving a car down the assembly line and we forgot to put the steering wheel on it <laughs> at the end. We're not giving Didn't these kids, <laughs> let's get back to basics. Now, my short period of time here, which is a month now, I hear about new, new, new. You know, sometimes getting back to basics and the old saying, blocking and tackling, is a good thing. When people know what to expect, not a new rollout every year of a new methodology every year, because there's some academician out there at some university who comes up with the latest and greatest that kids are going to learn better by this methodology. Sometimes I think we outthink ourselves. Yeah. And what kids, it's consistency, it's repetition, it's all those things where they feel comfortable in that environment. And we might want to get back to some of those basics that for decades have been tried and true methods of success. And I go back to things like flashcards. Like, now, I may be dating myself, but you know no, what? Flashcards still work. They still work. <laughs> yeah. And well, reading our results right now don't really warrant a new method. What they warrant is tried and true methods that work. Yeah. You get better at reading no by reading those methods, more. though. I don't think those methods exist. I don't know what those methods are. What, they work? The old ones? <laughs> that work? work? What, what methods that work? Oh, flashcards work. Reading to children works and I think some of that is still being done but we're still having some of these same issues but we're probably not doing it enough okay and who, who is the repetition who is in the our week? schools repetition we all own part of this issue okay whether it's us you want me to talk into this I can yeah. do that Melissa well I think that Jeff mentioned that too is um the village you know help at home and that kind of thing and, and that's how do you I, do flashcards I mean, by yourself and know? that's what I mean about a qu an equation of failure it's a failure of every aspect of it I mean, it's the students, it's the parents, it's the administration, it's the teachers. Nobody can say that I don't have a hand in this. I mean, right. it's the board, it's the community. I mean, it's a it's, it's a complete systemic equation that causes this, this failure of success. And I know what you're saying, Bill. I mean, no gimmick is going to fix this. I mean, so. I believe that's what he also said when he mentioned the ABC, getting back to the basics. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he made that presentation mm -hmm. as well because – like you all have said, it is going to take all of us. It's going to take the continued repetition of getting that information out there, but it's going to take all of us, not just DPS, everybody within DPS. I couldn't agree with that more. I think each one of us has to look at ourselves and say, what can we do to, to help be part of the solution rather than part of the problem? And, you know, I hear a lot of community conversation well that's not our problem that's not our problem it's it's everybody's problem right. I agree. and we all have to get in this boat and start rowing in the same direction so how, how do we 
formalize that. You know, everybody's working together instead of it's not my problem, not my problem, you know. Can we create partnerships? Is there somebody we haven't partnered with that we can and build these <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've seen Programs, us, yeah. um, and they've reached out, and we've reached out, and you've seen a few things come across, you know, your desk for approval, uh, like ISU, and he just yeah, mentioned something now. Yeah. So that's the goal, to continue to get partnerships yeah. to to assist us. Yeah. Um, first off, before I say anything, I just want to thank everybody, Jeff, Dr. Clark, everybody sitting out there, our administrators, our teachers, everybody in the building, you know that I am panicking about (laughs) the data, about my kid, about whatever. So at the outset, I know this is a really big job. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you guys showing up every day for the kids. I appreciate everybody watching, parents. Um, I really like what you're doing with the homeschool connection um, and what you guys are trying to do with that. And... Um, you know, like that video, what people can do with prompting. I, I noticed that my, you know, I write, that's my job. And, and I remember being in English composition in high school and writing a lot. And, you know, I read what my kid is writing and it's just, you know, just he's, he's spelling everything, you know, phonetic, like just how it sounds. And, and I can see how you can make that progress or even just speeding things up. And, and I, I'm sitting here watching this video thinking, yeah, that's something that we can just do over cereal on yeah. Saturday morning or whatever that is. And, and I agree that I think that that, obviously I don't have the credentials that you have, but I can see how simple things like that, that I can incorporate into my family's life might help me be a better partner with my son's teacher, for example, right? How can I help my kid be better prepared? Um, And how can we get that sort of, that information, that simple stuff, because you know there's only like a handful of people watching this, (laughs) you know, into the grand scheme of things, right? And I agree, community partnerships are huge, that sort of thing, but some, it's just, how do we get that resource, what you guys are doing, because I think that's so hugely important. And, And from a, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I get it. Focusing on, on pre-K to two, I'm totally with you. I get it. You know, emotionally, I'm like, what about these guys in the middle? That's where my interest is right now. Um, you know, but, but making things available, to, you know, parent classes. Because I also think some parents are just intimidated about coming into schools or figuring yeah. out how to help. And, and so getting those resources into their hands and, you know, even coming off of the pandemic, I don't know if I'm allowed to volunteer in my kid's classroom. I don't know if, if, if his teacher even knows how to ask for help or what we can do, you know. And so even just removing barriers like, hey, people are welcome in the schools. Did you, if you didn't know that, come on in this is how you do it and I'm sure that's more building level but really making a push to say hey our doors are open you know these are things that that you can do to help your third grader we're going to put it on our website we're going to have a tutorial on the video to tell you how to do it or here's the resource and I'm not trying to put more work on your plate but I do think it's good it's a good place to put some effort you know for parents that so that they know, like, this is something that I can do to help them that's easy, five minutes that we can right. repeat and do again and make a challenge out of it or whatever, or flashcards. Yeah, um, I make my kid write spelling words 20 times down a line like my grandma used to yell at me and make me do, you know. But just make, those Make them write things. a story using the spelling words. I was going to say, don't yeah. do not do that. <laughs> 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 they, they hate writing when you do stuff. They, they hate writing when you do stuff yeah. like that. Mm. But I also, but, two things, and I'm going to give it back to you, Jeff. Uh, we still do have uh, MTSS, multi-tier systems of support. We still do uh, response to intervention. So we are still putting things in place to assist students at certain levels, and, and Mr. Dace can speak to that. But other things that parents don't uh, realize is that there are fun games that you can download on your kid's phone. So when you're not around, learning is fun. Mm-hmm. And I did that for my grandkids. So. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be fun. Even I know we used to have, I don't know where Denise is, but whatever that, where Peach Jar, whatever that was, that like a little like newsletter with tips, parent tips or that sort of thing. I'm not mm-hmm. giving a directive, but just things that are grade level appropriate that we can shoot down and say, hey, try this with your kids that go out to, to people. <laughs> yeah, that would be mm-hmm. awesome. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you, Jeff, is if you're still doing your bees or Better stuff this year or, you know, those <laughs> things. I think that some of the kids 
you know, to the extent you're not focus, focusing on, you know, just that seemed like something that, that yeah. some kids found motivating. That was, that, was, that was part of teaching is modeling. So the district modeled last school year. So we're transferring that to the schools this year. Okay. I actually got a question about that today because one of the kids finished their fast bridge and they was like, uh, when I'm getting my T-shirt. Aww, <laughs> so yeah. um, that was that was. That was probably a hefty bag, but I think it, it was beneficial. But I don't. The district per se cannot continue that, but schools have money in their budgets where they can they can do that for their for well, their students. A, That's part of the incentive process. It's a good point about the the district continuing it. Uh, 1984, president called for businesses to help with you know the education, help schools with their education goals. Mm -hmm. Booking program came out of it. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that you know somebody in Decatur can help us with that, but what if there were something like that? Somebody we're actually doing that, and and even last year we had the one book one quarter where every student mm -hmm. received a mm -hmm. a book out of I forgot what the initiative is called, but our library um, coordinator Miss Knut Knutson, uh, I think it's every is it Christelle is it every quarter that they'll be getting a book. I think it may be every semester or whatever. The students will be getting the book. Um, so there's we have a version of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I just mentioned that. I mean, I, I know that there are several business owners in Decatur that I don't know if they watch this or if they're willing to help with anything, you know, yeah. type of incentive programs, you know. And, that, and that, that's the thing. We I think we have a lot of resources. Matter of fact, the principal just said today, uh, we don't need any more resources. We just need to get acclimated and familiarized with the resources that we have because if we keep getting new resources it goes back to what you're saying um okay we didn't we didn't master this so we yeah. didn't get familiar with this now kids are switching yeah. which is one of the things why i said you know we have all of the resources for reading math and everything it's like um we just need to get familiarized with our resources and to make sure they align to the standards that we need to address yeah. um, i, I I, I know you're talking, you know, test scores and that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm thinking about the but again, I'm, issue I'm, with again, reading at grade level. And, and even me, you know, yeah, people will look and say I'm the, I'm the data guy or data <laughs> man, but it's, it's, it's all about getting them prepared for that next grade level. And then the scores will happen. If we get them prepared for the next grade level, yeah. the scores will come up so indirectly. So even I had to change my narrative of, always talking about get the test scores up get the yeah. test scores up no if we get them from we get the skills that they need to be prepared at this grade level the test scores will eventually go up speaking of data are we collect and i mean i understand the, the rationale behind um absenteeism are we collecting any kind of information from these kids or these families on why they're missing so much school there could be systemic problems that they're facing. I mean, I don't think they're just sitting at home watching cartoons. But they're missing school because of a reason. Yeah, I think Lawrence has that. Oh, yeah, I mean, when, <laughs> come on. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just like in, in industry, they utilize what's called, uh, you know, uh, root cause analysis or 5Y okay. analysis. I mean, that there's a they're trying to find the reason, the, co the core reason why they're missing so much school. I mean, there's not one reason, but there's probably commonalities. Yeah. You got something from Lawrence? <laughs> <laughs> so um, as a part of the multi-tier systems of support schools do have attendance plans and they have um, they implement strategies to try to combat um, absenteeism um, we do especially in the elementary level have liaisons who help to work through uh, barriers to getting into school. Uh, we have individuals and in student services that do the same thing. One of the biggest issues in Decatur right now is um, tardies, uh, but not just 10, 15 minutes, extreme tardies. And those tardies accumulate uh, because the, sc the students are significantly late, which it results in a half a day out of school. Um, and so those are kind of some of the extreme nuances that we're dealing with right now. But uh, the reality is there are some parents who do allow their kids to sit at home um, on <laughs> well, the couch certain. and yeah, eat I mean, cereal. Um, so I, I, I try to believe in the essential goodness of yeah, people that want to do the right but thing. But overall, we do, we do have an attendance plan. Um, the regional office also has, um, they're revamping their 
truancy initiative. That's something that we haven't had in years, right? Uh, where in times past, we used to have support from um, not only the Regional Office of, Office of Education, but we used to have support from the state's attorney's office. There was a daytime curfew ordinance that was established in Decatur. And over time, those uh, resources and support have diminished. You know, they're, they're no longer available or accessible. So when there is no, um, you know, real penalty for missing school, individuals talk, they start spreading the word. And so, you know, we have schools or, you know, we have some parents, the most extreme cases will say, I'm not sending my son to school for this or daughter to school for X, Y, Z reasons. And then we're stuck with the consequence, you know, not only the academic consequence, but the absenteeism consequence. And then we have no support. So we're screaming for assistance, um, but we we have no way to really like pull them in um, and make them sit down and come to school. How fluid is the system when it comes to getting them on a bus to their school? Let's say somebody you know, has a parent, single parent household that has works the third shift and that kid can't stay at home by themselves while their mother or father works that shift. So they are staying with their aunt or uncle that's in another attendance boundary. The mm -hmm. bus isn't going to piss pick them up there. How do they get to school in the morning? That's, the, a, that's an example. That's an extreme example. Right. Okay. So if they're not at their home mm -hmm. in the morning, they're at somebody else's house out of circumstance. How do they get on the bus? And and so we don't provide busing for that, but that's where our parent liaisons come in. Uh, so we can we can assist if we know what the real issue is. Um, so you need to be asking that question because people that are holding on the right yes. their fingernails aren't really you the know. liaisons are tasked to ask that. And then sometimes we so we send out truancy letters, and those letters basically are a way for us to communicate with families to let them know, okay, your your son or daughter has missed. Um, X amount of days of school. If you need assistance or what have you, let us know. And then we also talk about the consequences of it, of um, absenteeism. Um, so those questions are asked. Um, and so when we know what the cause is, we do try to help and assist those families. And and you know, I was at one elementary school, and there was a father who dropped his son off, and he was late. And, you know, the liaison was trying to ask some question, really not a very um, great conversation, but I was able to pull the dad to the side. And it was one of those very instances. He worked third shift. He had another kid that was across town. He was trying to get them to their school, different time, uh, bell times. So, you know, we do try to work with uh, families when we know the issue. It's, it's when we don't know the issue where it presents the larger, larger problem. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Dave, Mr. Trimble. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That will end our reports from administration. We will now move on to our consent items. Does anyone want an item pulled from the consent items to discuss and or vote on separately? Do you have a recommendation for the consent items? Yes, I recommend the board approve the consent items as presented, which includes A, minutes, open closed session meeting, October 25th, 2022. B, freedom of information report. C, invoice from Macon Piatt Special Education District regarding services from Urbana School District 116. Do you have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, discussion? <clears throat> Roll call vote. Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Mr. Clevenger. Aye. Ms. Banks. Aye. Dr. Collins Brown. Aye. Mr. Taylor. Aye. Mr. Dion. Aye. And Mr. Scheider. Aye. Seven aye, zero nay. Motion carried. <coughs> Excuse me. We will now move on to our roll call action items. Do we have a recommendation for the personnel action items? Yes. I recommend the board approve the personnel action items listed in the memo from Jason Fox, Director of Human <coughs> Resources and the Human Resources Department as presented. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? <coughs> Roll call vote. Mr. Scheider? Aye. Mr. Dion? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Dr. Collins Brown? Aye. Mrs. Miss Banks? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. And Mr. Clevenger? Aye. Seven aye, zero nay. Motion carried. Do we have a recommendation to vote on a potential student, um, on the recommendation to vote on a potential student 2223-0002? Eight nine expulsion. 
Yes, I recommend the Board of Education authorize the issuance of a decision in the expulsion case for student number 2223-0002-242289 consistent with the findings from the hearing officer's report and that student number 2223-0002 be expelled from Decatur Public School District all events, property, and activities of the district for the remainder of the 2022-2023 school year and all of the 2023-2024 school year with the state for alternative education. Do you have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Only to say that I will be abstaining because I was not present for the expulsion hearing. Said. Roll call vote. Dr. Collins Brown? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Mr. Scheider? Aye. Ms. Banks? Aye. Mr. Clevenger? Aye. Mr. Dion? Aye. And Mrs. Lewis? Abstain. Six aye, one abstain. I motion to release motion closed, carried. Oh, motion carried. I motion to release closed session recordings in compliance with PAC, um, with PAC 72503 order. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion? I think Mr. Attorney Brown. Uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, can you come explain exactly what is being released? Yes. So the there were approximately 30 hours of closed session tapes which were relevant to the request for recordings from the AG. Those recordings included elements that were contained ultimately in the order and elements that were not contained in the order. Um, what we did we is our office um, is edit those tapes for strict compliance with the PAC order. Uh, PAC is access counselor. Um, the instruction there was to make sure that we were fully compliant with the order so that if anything was questionable we included it if anything was clearly out, we obviously excluded it. What remains is roughly two and a half or three hours of closed session tapes that will be available on the district's website, I believe on Friday. I will be reading a statement to that effect in a second. Gotcha. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Roll call vote. I'm sorry, what's the motion in a second? Who motioned? I motioned. Okay. And Jason Zeck. Kevin did. Kevin, okay. Kevin, Kevin. Sorry about that. Kevin. K -E -I. Yeah, I gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Mr. Dion. Aye. Mr. Clevenger. Aye. Ms. Banks. Aye. Mr. Scheider. Aye. Mr. Taylor. Aye. And Dr. Collins Brown. Aye. Seven I zero nay. Motion carried. The board has voted to release portions of the closed session audio recording that were determined to be open session topics. These portions of the closed session will be posted to the Decatur Public Schools website this Friday under the Board of Education tab where our other minutes and meetings recordings are located. We will now move on to announcements. The Board of Education sends condolences to the family of James Conway Forrester who passed away Thursday, October 20th, 2022. Mr. Forrester was a social worker for the Macon Pyatt Special Education District at SELA. Susan Purcell Pritchett who passed away Sunday, October 23rd, 2022. Ms. Pritchett was a retired school uh, teacher and school librarian for Decatur Public Schools. Barry A. B. A. Butts, who passed away Monday, October 24th, 2022. B. A. was a former special education elementary teacher, coach, principal, and director of schools for instruction. Upon his retirement, he was the director of special programs in central office. B. A. served in education for 52 years and was a member of the Decatur Public School Board of Education from 2013 to 2017. We will now move on to important dates. November 5th, Legacy of Learning Alumni Award Banquet at Milken University. For more information, please contact Zach Shields, Executive Director of Decatur Public Schools Foundation at 217-362-3042 and or at zshields at dps.org, zshields at dps61.org. Uh, November 8th, Election Day, no school for students and district offices are closed. November 9th, district-wide half days of school for all students, no half day pre afternoon pre-K programs. November 11th, Veterans Day holiday, uh, school is in session full day for school all students. November 11th, interim 
progress reports. The next public portion, uh, the next portion of the next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be at 3.30 p.m. Thursday, November 15th. Tuesday. 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 Sorry. Tuesday, November 15th at, um, at November 15th. 2022 at the Kyle Administration Building with an open work session. The Board of Education will move into closed executive session at 5 p.m. and resume open session at 9.30 p.m. At 6.30. At 6.30, sorry. It's a little, you know, getting over the flu. Gotta get you some coffee. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> at the Kyle Administration Building. The Board of Education will begin the November 2015-2022 Board of Education meeting at... 3.30 p.m. with an open work session regarding next steps with the strategic plan. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion carried. We are now adjourned. Woo! You made it.